Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Unit 2, the Part 2, Macronutrients and KCAL Estimates. So, what are we discussing here? You know, I know you guys can't see this, but uh, I've got a ma microphone here. I feel kind of like I'm doing a podcast. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Episode 67 of Macronutrients. Anyway, sorry, I digress. So what are we discussing here? We're going to discuss estimating kilocalories. We're going to look at equations versus kilocalories per kilogram, and we're going to face them off against each other. We're going to discuss permissive underfeeding and just kind of do go over what I do in my practice. Um, there, like I said before, many different ways to get this done, many different bridges over the river. Again, the most important thing is to look for one that works for you. So estimating needs. Um, this is part of the assessment. It's, it's always part of the assessment. One of the things that they're bringing the dietitian in for is to assess needs and see how much the person needs and how much they're taking in to compare them against each other. Uh, usually they're looking for three things, unless there's a real concern of a micronutrient deficiency. They're typically looking for, uh, kilocalories, protein, and fluid. It's important to remember that indirect calorimetry is still the gold standard for a couple of reasons. I, it's the actual measured value. It's so as opposed to estimating, as we're going to discuss, you're measuring the actual metabolic rate of the person. Uh, but the downside is that they're virtually never used except in acute care settings or research centers. This is getting a little bit less true now because they're getting cheaper. But in all of my time working in long-term care for uh, rehab facilities and nursing homes, no one has ever said, let's go get the met car yeah, met metabolic cart and see how this person is doing. It, it doesn't happen. So if you're working with older patients, unless you're in a hospital setting, you're probably doing some estimations. All right, so there's two versions or two different tacks, I guess you could say. Uh, the first... Uh, TAC is equations. You can take an equation to estimate kilocalorie needs. There's a bunch to choose from. Uh, the most common one you'll see is the Mifflin St. Jor. There's also the Harris Benedict. There's the Who. There's the Ireton Jones. There's the Henry. There, there are many more than that. It's just a list of a couple. Um, so what should you choose out of this? Generally speaking, Mifflin St. Jor was found to be accurate. Um... It's the most commonly used, at least within, uh, well, at least within North America in the Midwest, which is the area I can attest to. Uh, it is endorsed by the Academy and by the Healthy Aging DPG. It does appear to be less accurate for obese and older patients. Uh, that said, it is validated and endorsed by the uh, Healthy Aging DPG, so, you know. All, all of these are going to have trade-offs. Uh, what are the pros of an equation? Uh, some equations appear to be quite predictive for specific demographic groups. Uh, so looking if you have the right patient population, knowing which equation you can use or is available to you can be very beneficial. They're also very universal and very uniform. If you tell, tell somebody, well, or you note in your, in your charting, I use the Harris-Benedict for that. All the other dietitians know what you're talking about. There's no confusion as to where this came from. There are cons. Oh, hi, I'm up here, by the way. I ran out of room due to the citations over... Yeah, there. Um, the problem... The first problem is kind of like the same problem as the labs, which is that they're either vetted on healthy young people who are willing to go to research labs and take part in these studies, or they are on critically ill ventilated people, typically, at least very critically ill people, because there's kind of a captive audience that they can control the intake of. Uh, it's very hard to do these kinds of research evaluations from people's homes or having people come into a lab setting. Um, they do appear as a whole to struggle with obese and elderly patients. As with both of those demographics, you find that the variation is much higher than it is with a standard healthy population. And it's probably because that's how it was they were originally built. And uh, stress and activity factors are a little bit arbitrary. Um, if you've done these, you look at, they'll say, 
an activity factor of say 1.2, which is typically bed rest activity factor up to if you're a very, very active patient, 1.5. Then there's a stress factor, which is if you have a broken bone, it's this. If you have a burn, it's this. Uh, they can feel a little bit arbitrary. So the other option is uh, kilocalories per kilogram. Uh, many disease states have a recommended kilocalorie per kilogram range. Uh, for example, 30 to 35 calories per kilogram for wounds. Uh, this actually is noted in the evidence analysis library. They note 18 to 22 calories per kilogram approximately for women and 20 to 24 calories per kilogram for men. They also note that it appears that re residents, I'm sorry, that that's the term for patients in long-term care facilities. We'll get there later. Uh, that they can, an elder patient can need up to 40 calories per kilogram depending on the level of stresses involved. So what's, what's good about them? They are extremely specific. If you have a patient that is, say, uh, on um, end-stage renal disease, on hemodialysis, there is a very specific range of recommendations for that person. They're supported by professional groups. Uh, again, we can look at the kidney patient. The Kidney Foundation has a recommendation for ranges on both calories and protein, which we'll get to later. Um, and the stress factors are kind of built in. Again, we're talking about somebody with a specific disease state, so those stressors are built in. So what's bad about them? Uh, it's kind of the same thing as before. They're a bit myopic. Because they're focused on, say, again, someone on end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, that's it. That's, that's the whole thing that it's focused on. So if you have somebody with multiple comorbidities, it can be a little bit difficult to figure out where to, how well that recommendation tacks onto that person's needs. Uh, they have varying, varying success in clinical trials. I would argue that there, and this, this is very debatable, I would argue that there's more variation and less success with calories per kilogram versus an equation. What you'll often see in the literature is a, a equation or several equations used, and then they will translate that into this means about this much range calories per kilogram. So they do seem a little bit less accurate than an equation. So um, what's the bottom line on this? What a, <laughs> why am I telling you all this? Uh, indirect calorimetry is still the best way to get needs. But you're probably not going to have that available to you everywhere. Again, not in long-term care settings. Not even all the time in acute care settings. This is typically reserved for people that are in very critical need. Um, equations and calories per kilogram both work. There are pros and cons to both of them. The most important thing, again, and again, one of two things that's going to come up over and over again is consistency. The important thing is that you're using a similar tool each time so that if there's a change in status, you know to what degree it's going on. So we're going to talk really quickly about permissive underfeeding. This comes up in especially in geriatric care. Um, we're just going to go over the... Um, definition of it very quickly. It's the intentional reduced provision of calories. It's proposed to control hyperglycemia, obesity, uh, triacylglycerides, I, I regret that they changed the name on those, and inflammation. So why, why do they do that? Um, reduced, uh, because during an acute event, blood sugar increases. Um, it's shown, it has been shown, that patients with hyperglycemia have poorer outcomes than patients with controlled glucose levels. So the argument is that we don't over, we, we're taking care not to overfeed them so they're not getting excess calories and thereby increasing their glucose levels. Now it should be noted that almost every group, I have many here, because I'm sure there's bound to be a few um, that don't, most organizations promote a hyperproteic uh, feeding uh, to encourage protein synthesis, even if they are encouraging a reduced calorie intake. And I say most because uh, the standards for aspen do endorse uh, underfeeding with hyperproteic amounts. The European um, aspen does not endorse that. So there, there is some differentiation there. So what's the uh, 
pro on this. So there's a pro and a con side. There's a pro and an anti-group, I guess I should say. So the pro-hypocaloric group is saying that the patient's already in an inflamed state and reducing the uh, reducing calorie in provision, this is typically done in a nutritionally supported state like enteral, that uh, because they're already in, a, in an inflamed state, that providing fewer calories, restricting the calories, helps control the glucose range without needing to provide insulin for the patient. It allows for more tight control of glucose. Maybe it reduces some weight. Maybe it reduces some inflammation and stress. The anti-hypocaloric group says that these guys are coming in in a stressed situation. The patient's already stressed, and it doesn't really matter what you do. They're all they're going to be stressed and inflamed. All that you're doing is promoting catabolism and underfeeding the patient then full nutrition support for the whole range is a better is a better target. So uh, what are the results on this? Um, you are free. Uh, this side. Sorry. No, I cannot get this right for the over there. There we go. I have to figure it out. Uh, you can have have read for yourself. The uh, results are very indeterminate. Um, there really is not a leaning one way or the other. So. Um, some of this will depend on the uh, head of your care team, the doctors involved. Some of this will depend on the institution you're in. There's good arguments for both. And um, I neglected to mention that. Why, why is this important for geriatric patients? Because geriatric patients are already considered fragile. And so the concern about whether or not we're going to underfeed them on purpose becomes much more acute. So what do I do? Um, Again, I'm working in long-term care settings. I'm working in nursing homes, uh, rehab hospitals. So I don't have a metabolic cart. I generally use the Mifflin St. George uh, because that's endorsed by both um, the Academy and the Healthy Aging DPG. I will often compare it against the evidence analysis library's range. Uh, so remember, it's 18 to 22 for women 20 to 24 for men. Um, if a patient has conditions with specific recommendations, I will follow that instead. For example, if there's, since we've been talking about end-stage renal disease, if I have a patient that's on end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, I will prioritize that over other conditions. And we do have a bit coming up later, a bit. I sound like I'm doing a skit. No, we have a, a, a section coming up later where I'm going to discuss how I prioritize those uh, conditions. So more to come, foreshadowing. So macronutrients of concern for elders. This is generally what, pe what doctors want is the calories, the protein, or the fluids. Indirect calorimetry is best for uh, to determine needs, but you're probably not going to have it. So there, and there is no one best validated system. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you that, but get used to that because that's going to, that's the other thing that's going to come up quite a bit is there is no one best system. Not everybody agrees on any of these. I feel like that's a bit of a bummer of an ending, but that's it for now. I will catch you on the next one. We talk about proteins and fluids. Have a good one. Bye.